Uh, we're in the part two of a series called Church Essentials. Um, we're going to be looking at what makes a church a church, right? And um, the best way to do that is to look at the first church. What, what, what were the elements that put together this first church? And so that story is told to us in the book of Acts. And the story of Acts, and towards the beginning of the book, um, they talk about how there, you know, Jesus died and rose again, and they were like, what does this mean? What does this mean? A bunch of people got together, about 3,000 total. They got together, and they're like, what do we do? What do we do? And it's recorded for us by, one of the, author, by the author of the book of Acts. His name is Luke. He wrote another book called the book of Luke. Okay, and he basically tells us, this is what I observed. This is what I saw the first church doing. And he, he almost knew, like, when he was writing this down, that this is going to be a big deal. And 2,000 years later, we're still around. So it was a big deal, right? And so he's observing this new things happen called the church. And he says, these are the four things I saw them doing. And this is chapter 2, verse 42. Let's take a look at that. They, these are the people gathered together, they devoted themselves. And the word devoted, we talked about this last week, is the word poskaratero, which is Greek, which means nothing to all of us. But what, what that means, okay, is, and I'll be explaining some other Greek words today, what this means is they devoted themselves, means they, they made a habit out of it. They got together on a regular basis so that maybe if we just keep doing this, it'll kind of get infused into your DNA. So if you come to church every Sunday, to Westlight or any other church, you're trying to create a habit in your life, and that's what these guys were doing. And these habits were these following four things. Apostles' teachings, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayer. Now, last week I said that these four things seem pretty basic to us, right? But I think these four words have mean, has, has gotten different meanings over the years. 2,000 years ago, these four words did not mean the things that we understand these four words to mean. And so we're going to take each week talking about each of these words. Last week, we talked about the apostles' teachings and how the apostles' teachings is not the apostles basically saying, hey guys, guess what? Jesus died on the cross and rose again. Let's talk about this again next week. That's not what they were talking about. What we learned last week is this, that the apostles' teachings are actually learning the implications of Jesus dying and rising again. If Jesus died for love, what does that mean that we ought to, how, how should we live our lives? What does that require of me? That's what they talked about, the million plus one implications of the gospel. Today we're looking at the word fellowship, and the word fellowship is an interesting one because we don't really use that word uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't know how many of you guys used the word fellowship this past week, probably zero or maybe close to zero. Um, I actually asked one time when I was speaking on a different topic, but I was using the word fellowship, I... You know, I was like, how many of you guys actually used the word fellowship this past week? And a few people in the back raised their hand. And I'm like, really, you did? It's like, yeah, we're talking about the fellowship of the ring. And I'm like, oh, you're those people. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's all you talk about. Okay. <laughs> okay. And some of you guys are like, yeah, I was talking about that today. But okay. But the word fellowship, now I'm going to teach you a Greek word. And it's not so that I could sound smart, okay, because, well, if it does make me sound smart, then I'll do that more often. But, but it's, to, and it's not to confuse you, but it's because this word is going to pop up over and over and over again today. Okay, and some of you guys probably know the Greek word for the word fellowship, because when we think about the word fellowship, we think, in the Christian circle, we think hanging out. Like after service, we're going to go out there and we're going to fellowship, right? We think fellowship means to go and get coffee together, or we think fellowship means let's go and um, get dinner, and we'll call that fellowship, right? But it's not what it means. So the word fellowship in the Greek is this word right here, koinonia. Take a look at the Greek because I want you to be familiar with the shape of it, what it looks like. Koinonia. Can you say koinonia? Koinonia. koinonia. Very good. Koinonia. Greek word, koinonia. Okay, it's written out for you right there. Koinonia doesn't really mean to hang out. As a matter of fact, if you used the word koinonia 2,000 years ago and you were like, let's go koinonia, and you took him to a coffee shop, they'll be like, what are you doing? That's not what koinonia is. If I were to pick a word, and by the way, there is no exact translation for this word because it means so many things. Hanging out would be one of the sub-words that would go on the list of, me of translations. The word koinonia, I think the closest word to the word, to our vocabulary today, is this word right here. Sharing. Sharing. Sharing our time, sharing our resources, sharing things, uh, sharing our talents, sharing our presence with each other. Sharing. Um, and the reason we know this is because of the following verses. Right after what we just read in, in Acts chapter 2, you find Luke describing what... what Koinonia looks like. Take a look at this. Verse 44. All the believers, you know, 3,000 of them, were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Now, you see the word common right there? Guess what that word common is in the Greek? Next slide. 
It's the root word for the word koinonia. It's koino. Koino. The word to have things in common is the same word for fellowship. Koinonia. Now, let me kind of explain to you what this looks like because I know this, this kind of put it for some of you guys like, you're like, wait a minute, my stuff is not my stuff anymore? What does that mean? Is this communism? What's going on here? Did I sign, like, I don't want to be a member. I was thinking about being a member, but I don't want to be a member anymore because I don't like this idea. Okay, so let me explain to you guys. You can rest at ease. Okay. Scholars, when they look at this story and they're like, okay, what did it look like? This is what it looked like. So let's just say I have two TVs at home. They didn't have TVs back then, but let's, today's example. Okay, let's just say I have two TVs at home. And I'm watching one TV, and I realize, gosh, that other TV is just collecting dust. I'm not using that TV anymore. And then you go to church, and you find out there's another person in your, in your, in your fellowship, in your, in your community. There's somebody here that needs a TV. And you're like, hey, you know what? I have a TV that I'm not using. I will give you my other TV. I'm koinonia-ing with you. That's what it means. Or there's somebody that's in need, and they need something else, but I don't have that something else. But I know that if I put this on eBay, if I sell this, I could take that money and I could help that person get the thing that that person needed. We're meeting each other's needs by giving up the things that we don't have use for. That's what this is. Okay, so in other words, if I would give koinonia a a simple definition, it would be this. Koinonia is prayerfully sharing our resources with our community. Okay, and we're not talking about somebody saying, you, you have three of these, you only use two of them, sell one and give that to that person, because that's communism, right, okay? Because when you do things, like if you share things because you have to, that's not good. These people didn't see it that way. These people saw it like this. Not I have to give something to somebody, it's I get to give something to somebody. There's a big difference there. You get to participate in the life of the community. Okay, so these people had a lot of stuff, some people had multiple properties. Some people had many houses. And they're like, you know what? I don't need that house. It's nice to have that extra house, but I don't need it. So I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to sell it. I'm going to take it. And look over here. There's a, there's a bunch of widows. Now, back then, widows, um, they couldn't own property back then because they were so dependent on their husbands. If their husband died and if they don't have a son, then the widow becomes homeless. Usually in those days, that's what happened. And so this church would say, hey, look at that sister. She's part of us. We need to take care of her. How do we take care of her? Well, maybe we could put together some funds and do a fundraiser and help her out. That's what koinonia inks looked like back then. And they would prayfully consider. Now, the thing is this. Some of you guys are like, these guys are out of their mind. Like, why, what would cause them to do such a thing? Right? Like, what would make them want to do it? Like, if, if I got up there and said, hey, guys, there's a person in need. Everyone's like, here's money. And they're throwing money at this, you know, right? And you're, like, and you're watching everybody throw money at it. And they're like, these guys are crazy. I want to hold on to my money. Are these guys, like, why, why are they so generous? What's causing this? And Luke had the exact same question. He's investigating this whole thing, and he's like, what makes these people so crazy generous? And so he sticks around, and he's watching this whole thing happen. Two chapters later in chapter four, he sees it happen again. And this time, he has a theory as to how this thing actually works. So let's take a look at that. Chapter four. With great power, the apostles continue to testify the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy person among them. Okay, so this whole thing's happening again. Next verse. For from time to time, so it's not all the time, but whenever they see a need, so from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money uh, from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. So let's just say I'm like, I'm feeling extra generous today. What should I do? Oh, you know what? I have, you know... I have some extra clothes. I'm just going to sell this and take the money. And you come to the church and you're like, I have no idea who, needs need, who has any needs now. So you go to the apostles, the leaders of the group, and say, apostles, who's at need? And they'll say, that orphan over there just lost his parents. That person needs... So they take it to the apostles and apostles points the finger. He's like, okay, I'm going to go give this and help raise this child with the money I have. This is what it looked like. They helped each other out. If they had anybody in need, they wanted to help them. And when Luke says... You know what the secret behind this is? You know what caused them to do this? Did you, did you catch it in the previous slide? It said God's grace. God's grace is the thing that caused me to do this. And you're like, what, what does that mean? Like, what's God's grace? In some translations, okay, like a more modern version of the translation, it has this phrase right here. Grace happened. Or a better translation would probably be, you got graced. Like, Luke watches this whole thing and says, there's no way to explain this except 
uh, the only way I could explain it is that they got graced. Like, what, what does that mean? So let me walk you through what that looks like, okay? So remember the first thing on the list of things that these people at the first church did? They, they sat and they listened and they talked and they discussed about the implications of Jesus dying on the cross and rising again. Remember that? Okay, so as they talked about that, they start to discover that what God did, you know, what Jesus did on the cross was a gift. That Jesus died on the cross for us when we didn't deserve it, he gave his life for him. Imagine the most precious thing, precious being, precious anything in the world, that would be God. Okay, compared to God, we're like, like we're not even worth anything, right? God gave his entire self to it, a little, little, little people like, like us, right? People who don't really deserve him, right? And we're like, little things, and God's like this, and he's like, I'm going to give my entire self, I'm going to sacrifice my entire self for you, little, little, little people. Now, okay, and that is called God's grace. You realize, you look at the cross, you look at the resurrection, you look at the entire history, and you realize God has been pouring himself out to us all this time, and we have not done anything for him in return. He gave his own life for us. And at that point, you're like, what am I supposed to do in return? What, what can I do, God? Can I, can I repay you? Can I say thank you enough? Or what, what can I do for you? And when you start to realize that no matter what you do, or no matter what your posture in your heart is, you could never repay God, because God gave so much that we could never repay, right? At that, part, you're like, at that point, you're like, I know this does not even compare to the price you paid, God, but whatever I have, I, I, I want to give it to you. And what we call that is this. It's called surrender. So God's grace, when you get graced, you get to this posture of, I, I'm so little, I'm so nothing, uh, but whatever I could give, I want, to, I want to give it to you because, you know, everything I have belongs to you now. Now, when you get to that point, that means that all your possessions, all the property you have, every dollar, every penny you have, even your entire self belongs to God now. And so when it comes to there's a need in the church, you ask God, you're like, God, what, what, what am I supposed to do with what I have? And then God would prompt you. Well, there's somebody in need, and I know you have extra stuff. I'm not, call, I'm not telling you to sell everything you have. I'm just asking you to get rid of the, some of the stuff that you don't have use for anymore. Take that and help somebody else out. So God's grace leads to surrender, and surrender leads to prayerful generosity. You say, God, what, what do you want me to do with this stuff? How can I bless somebody today? What, you want me to help out that widow? Okay, I, I will definitely do that because you know, this is your stuff anyways because you pay this ultimate price that I can never repay. Uh, oh, sure, I, I will help out this person with what I have. What, what do you want me to do with this? Oh, you want me to, okay, you want me to help the, the orphan? Okay, I'm going to go do that right now. Oh, there's, you know, there's, there, there's, we're building houses for people that, that can't afford housing? Oh, okay, well, I, I, I have some extra energy. Maybe I could use my energy, my resources as an energy and t- have time. I will use the extra time I have and I'm going to go serve and build houses for people in Culver City. Right? This is koinonia ing. Grace happens, and as a response, there's 3,000 people in Jerusalem who are saying, God, what am I supposed to do? What do you want me to do? And their natural response is generosity. Generosity with their resources, generosity with their time, generosity with whatever they have at their disposal. That is what was happening in the first church. And so Luke is writing this down. He's like, well, I see that they're doing this whole discussion thing, okay, apostles teaching and they're doing this koinonia thing wow that's what koinonia that's what fellowship is it's not just hanging out it's the willingness to generously give something of yourself to the people around you so that there are no more needs now i'm going to give you two examples of this in the bible there's two examples first example i'm going to give you is one individual who was graced he got graced okay and the next example i'm going to give you is a whole community of people who got graced so let's start with the one with the one person okay now, before I show you the verse, I want to set up the scene. There's a guy named Philemon. Philemon owns a slave. Now, before you're like, whoa, slaves. Slavery in the, in, in the biblical times was different from how we understand slavery today. If I made a deal with somebody, and it was, I don't know, it was a deal, and I didn't go, my part of the deal didn't go well. As a matter of fact, I ended up being indebted to this person, okay? And because of that, I couldn't pay the fines that, that, was, that were due, and I'm, I've completely sold everything. I have no more money. At that point, I have to say, well, I can't pay you back, so I'm going to work it off. I'm going to live with you, and I'll be your servant or slave until it's paid off. So when, you're paid, when you pay off your debts, you're a free man again. That's, that's how slavery worked back then, okay? So in this story, Philemon is the person that's the master, and this guy named Onesimus, you don't have to know his name, but Onesimus is the one that's the slave. 
he is indebted to this guy named Philemon, and Philemon's like, until you pay me back, I'm not going to let you go. That's what's happening. Now, Philemon is a Christian. And Onesimus, realizing that he can't pay Philemon back, he runs away. He's like, I can't live like this anymore. He runs away. And he's running away, miles and miles down the road. He bumps into one of the main characters of the New Testament. His name is Paul, Paul the Apostle, one of the first Christian leaders. And he, Paul, knows who Philemon is. He's like, hey, Onesimus, you're, you're Philemon's slave, aren't you? He's like, yes, I am. Well, I'm going to send you back. He's like, oh, please don't send me back. He's like, no, 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 no. Let's have a talk. So, so Onesimus and Paul sit down, and they have this conversation. And over that conversation, Onesimus becomes a Christian. His heart has changed. And so he's like, before I send you back, I'm going to write a letter to my dear friend Philemon so that he'll receive you with open arms. And we have that letter, and that's the book of Philemon, okay? We're going to pick them from verse 15, and you're like, which chapter? There's only one chapter in Philemon, so, it's, so you'll see the reference. It's going to say Philemon, verse 15. There's no chapter. Okay, let's take a look at that. He's writing to Philemon, his friend, okay? Paul is writing a letter. Philemon, perhaps the reason he was separated, he's talking about Onesimus, why Onesimus was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. What he's saying is, hey, maybe, I don't know, I don't know how this whole God thing works, Paul would say, but maybe, I don't know, just maybe, there's a good possibility that the reason he ran away was that God allowed him to run away. Because by running away, he would meet me, and he'll, when he comes back to you, you no longer have a slave, you have a brother in Christ. It's like, maybe that's the bigger plan that God had here, okay? Now, if you hear that, what's the first thing that goes through your mind as if you were Philemon? You're like, but, 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 He's not my brother. He's my slave. He owes me money. What, are you saying that if he becomes a Christian, he doesn't owe me money anymore? What's going on here, Paul? Thanks for making him a Christian, right? That's, that's probably what's going through his mind. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Now, remember what's going through Philemon's mind. Who's going to pay the debt that was incurred by this man right here? Look carefully at the next verse. This is very important. So if you consider me a partner, he's like, you know, we're good friends, Philemon. You and I work really good friends. If you really consider me a good friend, listen to what I'm about to say. Welcome him as you will welcome me. I want you to be treating him, not as a slave from now on, but as a brother like you would treat me. What about the money thing? What about the money thing? Paul says this. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, which he does because he's still a slave, what does he say? He said, charge it to me. Paul says, I don't know how much money I have in my bank account, but I will pay it off. Did I read that wrong? Well, maybe. I don't know. Let's see if, 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 what he means. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. It's like, oh, no, he, he means it, right? Paul is saying, whatever debt he has, I'm willing to pay it off. Now, where did this crazy generosity come from? Paul, why, what caused you to do this? Oh, wait, Paul, were you graced too? Were you one of those people who were graced? Well, there's some hints in this letter that tells us that he was. Now, you know, in our culture, when we write a letter, we sign off on the bottom, like, sincerely yours, cuts, right? That's right. Now, in this culture, they didn't write their names at the end of the letter. They put their names at the beginning of the letter. So in order to see this clue that he was graced, we're going to go to verse 1 of this whole letter, okay? Look at this. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now, when he says prisoner of Christ Jesus, this is a phrase that was often used by, to, to imply that you were just graced. Basically, you're saying, I saw what Jesus did. I saw what God has been doing all this time to a little bit of me, okay? And I, I want to give him back. I want to give back to him, but, but all I have is what I have. Lord, everything I have is yours. Everything you want me to do, I will do because I am yours. And that's what they call the prisoner of Christ. Paul was graced. It's like a drive-by gracing. You know, oh, I've been graced, right? Now that you've been graced, he's like, and I've been praying about this, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay off the debt that Onesimus incurred. And so now you can invite him back as a brother instead of a slave. This is what it looks like to koinonia. It's not that nobody came up to Paul and said, I demand that what you have now belongs, you know, like he doesn't do that. It's just from the inside, the spirit just swells up in the inside saying, I just feel like I need to be generous now. It's like, I can't think of anything else but to be generous, to give myself to somebody. Now, that was the first example. Now, let's take a look at the example of when a whole community of people were, 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 were 
graced. Okay. Now, <clears throat> because I hope you caught this in this letter, the point here is this, that Paul, behind Paul's generosity was God's grace. It wasn't because there was some TV ad that showed up, you know, saying like, have you seen this poor kid right here, Onesimus? By donating this much money to my fund, this kid could have food. No, it wasn't like that. There was no guilting happening here, okay? It's just like, I was just moved by God to give and help somebody out. That's what grace looks like. By the way, the word grace in the Greek, charis, is the word, it means gift. God gave me a gift and I can't live my life but to gift somebody else, right? So now let's look at the second example. The second example is from 2 Corinthians. We studied 1 Corinthians earlier this year. That was this really sad book. 2 Corinthians is a little more uplifting, right? But this is what's happening. Remember how I said there were thousands of people in Jerusalem that became Christians? Well, over the years in Jerusalem, there was a big famine that happened. And so people were going hungry. And these Christians are now really, really hungry. They're like, oh, where are we going to get our food? And Paul sees this and says, there has to be a good way to take care of these Christians. And he's like, you know what? And he has this crazy idea. The crazy idea that Paul has is he's going to do a tour throughout Asia Minor and Europe and collect money from the churches. He's going to do the ultimate fundraiser that's ever been heard of in that time. So what he does is that he starts going to church, to church, to church, and every, along the way he'll stop by churches, and every, one, every once in a while he'll come across really poor churches, and he won't even mention it to them. They're like, well, what are you doing here, Paul? I'm like, oh, I'm just passing through. I just need a place to stay tonight. Right? Now, there's one church that he stopped at, which is in a place called Macedonia, okay, where he didn't tell them what, why he was there, because he knew that these people were really poor but they somehow found out that Paul was there to raise money. And so he's telling this story to the Corinthians. He's like, guys, let me just tell you a story of what just happened in Macedonia. It's the craziest thing that happened. There's a whole bunch of people there who are just graced. And let me share with you what happened. And this is 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He says, now, brothers and sisters of Corinth, I want to tell you a story. We want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of severe trials, meaning these people, for just being Christian, were being persecuted. Their parents were separated from their kids, and kids were murdered, parents were murdered. Some people were fired from their jobs just for being Christian. Bad things were happening. So when they were facing severe trials, that means that they're really, really poor, okay? They're facing severe trials, they're, but they're, what, they're overflowing joy, and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Like, these people started giving me money for the fund for, for Jerusalem, and they don't have anything. And I, the only way I could explain it, according to Paul, just like Luke, is I can't explain it, but maybe they were just graced. Next verse. For I testify, which means I swear to God, right? It's like I testify that they gave as much as they were able. And wait, wait, let me, wait, wait a minute. No, no, no. They didn't just give what they were able to. They even went beyond their ability. <laughs> They're like, they didn't just give me what was in their pockets. They went home, they emptied out their piggy banks, and they brought it to, them, to me and said, Please make sure that this gets to Jerusalem. What? What? <laughs> and get this. Entirely on their own. Nobody brought it up to them. They were like, I didn't even say, hey, um, maybe, you know, would you consider giving maybe like five cents, ten cents to this cause? Like, no, 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 no. Entirely, I never even told them about this. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us, please, 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 can we be generous and can we give to this cause? This is crazy, right? They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege, it's a privilege to them, right, of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. They're saying, Paul, please don't take this away from us. We want to give. If you don't take our money, you're actually stripping us away from this privilege that we have of actually paying back what God has done for us. They're like, this is what we're... Like, this is the only thing that we can think of. We can't sleep at night without thinking that, like, if just the thought that you're not going to take our money, it's going to make us feel cursed. Like, please, please, take this money, make sure it gets to the people so it can, it can help them, because we know there's hungry people there. We're hungry here, but we want to make sure that they're not hungry. Wow. What happened? Grace happened. A few verses down, Paul describes for us what this grace really is. Take a look. Verse 9. Oh, no, no. Oh, yeah. Go back. I just want to show that word koinonia shows up again right there. The privilege of sharing. That word sharing is the word koinonia. Again, it shows up all over the place. Next verse. Okay. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's like, because you guys know what this grace is all about, right? You've heard of this grace, and he explains what that is. That though he was rich, he's talking about God, though God was rich, 
yet for our sake became poor, so that you, through his poverty, God's poverty, might become rich. He's saying God in the heaven, he, was, he, had, he had it made. Everything was perfect. But then he decided, I'm going to come down to the level of a human being, and maybe even lower than that. Why? So that you can benefit from it. If that's what God did for us, he would remind everybody who's reading this letter, then maybe we ought to do the same for the people around us. He's like, this grace messed with the people of Macedonia, and now they're the most generous people I've ever met. People give, people are generous, not because somebody prompted them to be generous. They were generous because God messed with their souls, their DNA. They made him just say, I need to give something away to make sure that somebody does not have any more needs. But I want you to keep in mind, because this is not in the story that I just read right now, they prayerfully considered who they were going to be generous to. Because in today's world, you're going to hear people knocking on your door every five minutes, would you please give to this cause, give to this cause. And you're like, oh, if I gave, you know. No, these people prayerfully, they said, God, all I have is yours. I surrendered everything to you. What do you want me to give to? And that's what they did. And that total total thing I just shared with you is what we call fellowship. So in that verse that said, the first church dedicated themselves to, to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, that's what they're talking about. They empty their pockets and said, I want to help out the people who are in need. That's what fellowship is. It's not taking somebody to a coffee shop and saying, hey, we're fellowshipping. You know, that's not it. It's not like, hey, let's go eat afterwards, we're fellowshipping. That's not what fellowshipping is. As a matter of fact, the third thing on the list for next week's sermon, breaking bread, that's what that is. Okay, so we'll talk about that next week. But fellowshipping. Now, I want to make a quick point, and this is not the main point of of this message, but I just want to make a quick side point here. The first century church did not tithe they did not give 10% of their money and their belongings to the church. They didn't do that. They didn't even use the word tithe. As a matter of fact, you won't even find the word tithe in the New Testament. Because to them, it wasn't, well, the Old Testament tells us they were supposed to give 10% to the church, so we're gonna, they didn't do that. The whole idea of tithe was tossed out the window. Instead, they koinoniaed. They prayed and said, God, how much do you want me to give to the church? And then God would just impact their heart and say, you know, today, Kotz, I want you to give this much. And he's like, okay. So the whole idea of 10% was an old idea by the time the first century church started. To them, giving was just a part of who they were. You see, in the Old Testament, <clears throat> it said that 10% of your belongings belong to God, you live on the rest, 90%. That was Old Testament. That was a law, okay? In the New Testament, because people have been graced by God, okay, because of that, these people believed 100% of what I have belongs to God. How do you want me to use my money? How do you want me to use my time? How do you want me to use your resources? And when I pray that prayer, what I usually hear from God and what I think I hear from God is take care of your family. Give to what's important to you. Give to the church. If there's somebody in need, be generous with them. So you, we all have to understand from a place that God has graced us. Now we surrender. And because we surrender, God is in charge of how we spend our money now. And that is what fellowship is. And that is what caused the first century church to blossom to no end. Now, if you notice, to my left and right, you see these tables. That means we're going to take communion today. Um, Communion has different, uh, people call it the Lord's Supper, but we commonly call it communion. Some people call it the Eucharist. Now, let me put these two words up here, communion and Eucharist. Um, Communion and Eucharist was was a ritual that people partook in to remind themselves of that fact that God graced us. As a matter of fact, the word communion in the Greek language actually is translated to, you guessed it, koinonia. The word communion comes from the Greek word koinonia. The word eucharist, the word eu means good and charis means grace, good grace. Again, they all point back to this one thing, that God has done some amazing sacrificial thing for us and it was a gift to us and the question is, how do we pay him back? What do we do with what... What does this require of me? And the first century church said, this is what's required of us. We need to put our resources to what God thinks our resources need to go to. And by the way, everything that God calls our resources to go towards is always rooted in love. Always rooted in love. The way that we're going to love our neighbor is not just by saying, hey, I love you, but it's actually putting our hands and feet and wallet and everything that we have into loving that person. It has to be tangible. And so, 
at any point in your walk, you're like, wait, wait, why are we doing this again? Why, why, why am I sacrificing? Why am I t- giving away the things I have? And by the way, I have been a big recipient of fellowship or koinonia in this church. People, okay, for my older son, Justin, 90% of the clothes we did not buy. Some of you said, hey, we have clothes that we're not using anymore. Here you go. So I've been a recipient of koinonia. And I'm hoping that I'm doing the same for you. I've given away TVs. I've given away electronics because I have some of those things that I don't use anymore, right? <laughs> right? But I'm coordinating with you guys. And if you think that church is just coming, to, coming and sitting down here so that you can just listen to a sermon and sing a few songs and you go home, you're missing out because that's not what church is. Church, okay, remember there's four things on the list that we're talking about, but today we're focusing on just one of them. You're not really experiencing church unless you're coordinating. Do you consider this a church family to the point where you're willing to share your resources with each other? Maybe it comes in the form of baking. Hey, you know, I baked something, I know you're hungry, or hey, I know that you don't know how to cook. (laughs) Here you go. Hey, I know your family's in need. Hey, I know that your family's going through a tough time and you need some child care. We all came here to take care of your kids while you take care of the business you got to take care of. I'm coining my time with you. And by the way, the only way we get to know of each other's needs is when we're in circles, when we're in groups, when we're deeply involved in each other's lives to the point where without you even telling us what it is, we know your needs. And the only place that could happen in, is in life groups. I mean, sure, you could have superficial conversations on a Sunday morning. <clears throat> I'll say hi to you. You'll say hi to me. And maybe you'll spill something else, like, I'm in need, I need this, right? <laughs> and, you know, I'll say, well, I could do what, I'll do what I can to help you, but, but the best way to, to make this thing called fellowship, this thing called coining happen, is if you're in life groups. And so if you're in a life group right now, you're in luck because you have a group of people you could share your needs with. And maybe there's people in your group who are saying, hey, I don't know how I could help you, but I could sell one thing I have to help you out with that, maybe a little bit, I don't know, right? Or I could give you my time, or I could sacrifice this so that I could do this for you. But that's how a church operates. That's how a church flourishes. It's by us continually sacrificing ourselves for each other in the same way that God sacrificed for us. So if anywhere along the line you're like, I can't remember why I'm doing this. This is why the church have these rituals in place called communion. To remind us, remember what God did for us? Remember how God laid everything down for us? Remember how he paid the ultimate price, a price that we could never pay back? That's why, <clears throat> excuse me, that's why you're doing what you're doing right now. And so today we're going to remind ourselves why we coordinate with each other. We're coordinating today <clears throat> because we are reminded that Jesus paid the ultimate price for us. That he gave us a gift, a grace, that we could never pay back. And for that reason, God commands us to love one another, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. So what we're going to do is we're going to have Pastor Tim. Tim's going to come to this t- station over here. And I'm going to be standing over here, and this is how it's going to work. We're going to have the worship team come up, and they're going to play some music, some instrumental music, because I feel that music helps me concentrate and meditate a little bit. And when you're ready, it's open to everybody, anybody, if you feel like, yes, I, w- I need to be reminded of the sacrifice, the gift, the, the, the grace that God has given me. I need to be reminded of that. I want you to come up to one of the tables, whichever one has, you know, you're closer to or has a shorter line. And as soon as there's a few people gathered around the table, the pastor who's at the station will pass out the elements. You'll take a piece of bread, you'll take a cup, and when everybody's gotten it, then, we'll, then the pastor will say, okay, let's eat and drink together. And that's how it's going to be. And after that, you can go sit down. So nothing intimidating about communion or Eucharist. <clears throat> but we do want everybody to participate in this one. Because I think we all need to be reminded that there's this God that absolutely loves us, and he emptied himself for us. And that should be the motivation why we should do the same for the people around us. Amen? Okay, let's pray for